In this semester so far, we've learned a lot about uh, how to create these uh, different objects in Oracle. We, uh, we also learned how to manipulate those objects. Uh, we talked about DML. Um, and last week, we talked about some additional database objects that we have to worry about. Um, so now that we have all of these objects, uh, we have to start thinking about how to control those objects, who, who has access to the objects, who can do things with those objects. So that's what this unit is all about, is how to start worrying about permissions to these various objects that we create in Oracle. So we're going to start with some basics about data security. Uh, and certainly, there's, there's no shortage of courses here at uh, Goodwin and Drexel that you can take on data security. But uh, let's just talk about two concepts in, in data security, authentication and authorization. And basically, these two terms refer to who are you. So authentication uh, determines who you are. And authorization determines what you're allowed to do. So in the database world, we've got our database. And the first questions we have to, to figure out, or the first thing we need to know, is, is who, um, who is the person that's accessing the database. And typically in Oracle, we do that with a username and a password, which we're going to learn how to set up. Uh, but once you know who the user is, you also want to make sure that you know what they're allowed to access. Which objects are they allowed to manipulate? Which are they allowed to create objects? Can they delete objects? Uh, so all that stuff you have to take care of. And you know, it's, it's, um, there's a number of reasons that we have to worry about security. And, and most of this is obvious, but uh, you know, one big reason is you don't want um, someone logging into the database that shouldn't and then uh, making off with your data. So that would be, you know, that could range from, you know, somebody internal to the organization uh, having access to data that maybe they shouldn't have uh, to uh, uh, an attacker from outside the organization that's, uh, that's trying to steal, you know, uh, credit card numbers, trade secrets, things like that. And, you know, the reality is that, that a, a huge portion, if not most of the data in most organizations is stored somewhere in a database. So this is definitely a concern to make sure that we secure that data from nefarious people, as you see in my slide. But there's also another type of user, and, and that's the people that don't know any better. So we also need to make sure that we protect the database um, from access to do things that, that people shouldn't be able to do, not necessarily because they have evil intentions, but uh, but more so because, you know, maybe they don't know that they, that this command is going to delete a record or you don't want certain people being able to modify certain types of records. So, uh, so we also need to protect our database from those types of users. So, a couple different scenarios there. So, the basic command to create a user is uh, create user and then you provide a username. And identified by is, uh, is how you define the password. So that's how you create the password. And then the password expire option forces that user on their first login to create their password. Now, if you're going to use the database with, um, uh, with Oracle's user interface, the GUI, uh, that we don't really use in this semester, but um, you know, we've been using SQL Plus, uh, password expire I don't think works in that still. It, it, it hasn't before and I think it still hasn't, it's still not handling that password expire. So that means the first time you log in, the GUI doesn't really know how to handle that request to change your password. Uh, but SQL Plus it works fine. So you can certainly do that with SQL Plus, but I think most users are not interfacing or interacting with the database with uh, SQL Plus, at least in most organizations. So. Uh, the rules for creating a username and password is uh, 30 characters, and they can contain uh, letters, numbers, and the three symbols that you see in my list there. So dollar sign, underscore, and pound. You can't use any other symbols. If you do, it won't work. So you have to pick from that list. Uh, but that gives us some pretty strong passwords. So as an example, I could create user George W. Bush, identified, and you can see a password there. And it's a valid password. It's got characters. Um, and it's got uh, numbers, um, and there's an underscore, so one character. Uh, however, this password that you see here, so a couple things in that next command, uh, we have user Dick Cheney, and you can see that password has an equal sign in it, and that's not in our allowable characters. Um, 
and then you can also see it has password expire, so this is the syntax to uh, to force the user to enter a password uh, when they log in the first time. So there's a uh, an example of after we create a user, uh, it may be necessary to change that user's password. So if we had a user, say the username was Barney, uh, and that and Barney's password happened to be Miss Beasley with a capital M and a capital B. By the way, they are case sensitive. Uh, we could we could change that password. So if Barney forgot his password, we can set it uh, to in this case Miss Beasley. So now we're going to talk about privilege. We already know now how to create a user, so now we have to figure out how we can uh, provide privileges to that user. One thing I should mention uh, on the outset here is that uh, as as we have set this up right now, um, so let's say one of those three users in the previous screen, we created a George W. Bush and a Dick Cheney. When those users log in, by default, they're not going to be able to create a session because you have to grant them permission to do that. Um, so, so you do, you know, when you create that user account, unless you create default uh, default role for your users, it's um, you, they're not going to be able to do anything. They're not even going to be able to log in. So, when we talk about privilege, there's two things that uh, two basic categories of privileges, and your textbook talks about these. The first is objects, and the second is system privileges. Um, and I'll show you all three here. So objects, uh, you can see I have a list there. Um, that's a list of most of the types of objects that you'll find in, in Oracle, starting with tables, views, uh, materialized views, synonyms, indexes, sequence. These are all things we've learned about already. We haven't learned about uh, cache groups, replication schemas, uh, PL SQL functions, procedures, and packages. So those we haven't talked about yet, but those are also additional objects. So Privileges have to do with objects, and you've got two ways you can handle it. There's, if you take a look at the two at the bottom, you have system privileges and object privileges. So I have a little quote there, and that's right out of Oracle's uh, documentation. The right to perform a particular action or to perform an action on any object of a particular type. So, and by the way, that includes create session. So um, what's interesting about uh, system privileges is it's typically used to grant um, permissions for all objects of a certain type. Um, so it's not very granular. So typically you might use system privileges to grant uh, drop table. So that lets somebody drop any table. Or create table, which lets them create any table. Um, so they're usually pretty broad, those system privileges. As opposed to object privileges, which is where you um, can grant particular actions. So at the object level, you can you can give somebody uh, privileges for for a particular action, such as update, insert, delete, and select. So those specific actions you can you can very granularly assign what they're allowed to do at that table, and even down to the column level. So you can say somebody has permission to do an update, but only on certain columns. Uh, so, for example, somebody can only update the uh, salary, but they can't update the social security number, something like that. Um, so you can get pretty pretty granular with the object privileges. So again, system privileges lets them adjust at a very broad level. So you know, insert, update, delete on all tables, or uh, you know, create functions, create procedures, delete procedures, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so very broad. Where object lets you zero in on very specific things, even down to the column level. So let's take a look at some uh, some various uh, syntaxes for, for handling privileges. The first one is we'll talk about system privilege. Um, so it's uh, it, this is the simplest of the ones we're going to discuss. You have uh, grant, the system privilege that you want to grant. You can have them comma separated, so you can have multiple ones. And then you tell it what you want to grant to, and there are two options. You can pass a username or a role name. We haven't talked about roles. We're going to talk about that next. But just understand it can be either a username or a role name. So far, we've only talked about users. And again, those can be comma-separated as well. So you can list a whole bunch of users if you're trying to update a whole bunch at the same time. 
So an example of that might be uh, grant create session to Ronald Reagan. So when Ronald Reagan logs in, he can create a session and he can start interacting with the database. Again, if you don't grant create session, you can't log in with anything because you can't create a session to the database. So that's a very basic example. Um, here we grant create any table and alter any table to Ronald Reagan. So now Ronald Reagan, when he logs in, uh, is able to create tables and alter tables. So, which, you know, is a pretty basic uh, requirement. Now, what I should tell you is that if Ronald Reagan uh, does log in and creates a table, um, or alters a table, but more importantly, if he creates a table, he's the owner of that object. Implicitly, he'll have all permissions on that table, so he can do inserts, updates, deletes, uh, all that stuff on any column in that table. So, um, so again, if you create, if you give somebody access to create something, when they do create it, they have unfettered access by default. Now, you could later on go back and reference that object and take away permissions to do certain things. You could say, okay, now this user only has update, you know, update privileges or, you know, insert privileges to that table. We'll talk about object level in a minute, but um, but it's important to understand that if you create an object, implicitly you have um, all those more granular controls assigned to you. So let's talk about object privileges. Notice that this time, we've got a few extra options in the grant statement. Uh, not only do we have the object privilege, um, but there's also that keyword all. So instead of grant, you know, listing all these different things like select, insert, update, delete, instead of listing all those, you could just use all. So if you're giving somebody permission for everything on the table, um, you can use the term all. Uh, then you can list the column names to which you want this privilege to be uh, in effect for. And then you have an additional option here, too, with the on uh, clause. So the on clause, uh, you have to define exactly which object it is. So you know, go, going back to that slide two slides ago, if you recall, system privileges are very broad. So you don't define those on specific objects. Whereas object privileges, you have to define a very specific object. You have to say, this is the object that I'm assigning permission for. Um, so you're saying this particular table, this particular view, or this particular uh, sequence this person has uh, privileges for. And then again, you've got username and role name, but now we also have, um, in addition, we have the public option, which uh, is basically like everyone. So giving everybody access to do something, you can use the public keyword. So here's the syntax, uh, grant, select, and insert on a table called drone targets to a user called George W. Bush. So now this user would be able to both view uh, drone targets and insert additional drone targets. And maybe we have another user that um, we want to allow them to select and update uh, drone target coordinates. So this this user, which is Barney, is able to select the coordinates from the drone targets uh, and also update the coordinates for the drone targets. So in this case, we very granularly gave permission just for certain things on a single column. And then finally, we're giving this user, um, so apparently this, this user is uh, really calling all the shots in this case, and uh, we're giving them access to everything. So we're saying grant them all. So they can do insert, update, delete, uh, you know, all of the DML statements as well as the uh, as select um, on that drone targets, and we're giving that to a user named Dick Cheney uh, and with the grant option. So once you create all these um, privileges, uh, whether it's system or object privileges, these are the commands to select um, those privileges. So you know, if you want to see what you're allowed to do, uh, what your privileges are, you can type select star from user underscore sys underscore privs. And that will only show the, uh, the objects and, and uh, system privileges that you have, the user that you're currently logged in with. Uh, there are other virtual tables. Um, we'll talk more about views and system views later on in the semester. I think we talk about that actually in the last unit, but um, but for right now, um, if you look at uh, table 7-5 in your textbook, you'll see a whole list of, of, um, of views that you can use to look at privileges, to, to see privileges. And 
And in the next unit, we're going to talk about how to limit results. So we'll talk about how to do some some where clauses to, to limit what you see in those privileges, because some of them can be rather large, because it'll show the privileges for all users in the entire database. Um, so you do have varying levels of privileges that you can view. The important thing is, you know, a lot of folks will ask me, what, why does that say tab privs? Um, and, and really, I guess that's a short, short, short for table privileges uh, for user underscore tab privs. Um, but really, that's object. So, so that's the uh, the view that's going to show all objects. So it's not just tables; it's also sequences and indexes and functions and triggers and procedures and all that type of type of stuff. So, again, refer to Table 7-5, and you'll see all your options. And you can try those. So next, we're going to talk about roles, and so and why roles are important. So let's say, for example, we have one user account in our database. It's it's relatively easy to uh, to manage all these permissions for a single user uh, or just a small group of users it makes sense. But you know, think about it. There's a lot of granularity in the permissions that you can assign uh, users in Oracle, uh, and you could have you know you you can sit there for five minutes, create just you know just putting in different user permissions for what people can do in the database. Um, and you can get as, as focused and specific as you want, or you can make it very broad and say, uh, you know, anybody can just do anything in the database, depending on, on what type of data you have in the organization. But in any event, if you've got complex rules um, for, for your users, the thing you have to think about, too, is that, you know, most of these uh, users that are going to be using the database, a lot of them are doing the same thing. So, for example, you know this guy that I'm showing on the screen. You know maybe there's there's a whole bunch of these guys, and they're all doing uh, billing. So these are all billing people, and this is the same example that's in your textbook. So so all these folks are entering billing information, and then likewise maybe I've got a whole bunch of people that do order entry. So these are people that take the phone calls from the customers and enter their orders into the system, and each one of them has their own distinct set of privileges that they would need. So rather than than defining each one of them individually, we can create a role for each one. So I might have role A, which has, which contains all of the privileges needed for somebody who's doing billing. And then I might uh, assign that to all the people, um, you know, I might take all the folks that do billing and put them in that role. And if I ever need to change permission for what billing people can do, instead of going through each account one at a time to change those permissions, you can change it globally by using the role, by uh, by applying those changes to the role, as opposed to each individual user. Uh, and likewise, I might have role B, which is just the privileges needed for order entry. Um, and then, you know, usually you would have this sort of third user in the middle that, uh, you know, this might be a supervisor or a manager who oversees both departments, and he would need permission, or she would need permission for both role A and role B. Uh, that way, they could oversee, you know, and have permission to do what both of those groups of people can do. So you can have a little bit of overlap. And again, you know, anything that you uh, that you apply to role A would apply to all of the users that are a member or have that role. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of folks in these IT classes might be familiar with things like uh, Active Directory, where you have both roles and groups. But it's important to understand that we don't really have that group concept in, in Oracle. You have users, and users can have a role. Um, and I work in the healthcare industry, so a lot of times when I think about roles, uh, you know, I, I put it in the uh, in the context of a hospital, where you know, for example, in a hospital you might have a uh, uh, a doctor, uh, or you might have a nurse or uh, a clinician. But all of those people, while they may be members of different groups within the organization, so there might be a doctor in ER, there might be a doctor in cardiology, or a doctor in, uh, in, in neurology, or what have you. All of those doctors usually, uh, because they have the same role within the facility, they have the same rights and privileges. Um, you know, so a doctor, say, in cardiology uh, has the same rights and privileges as a doctor that works in the ER. Um, and likewise, a nurse that works in cardiology has the same rights and privileges as a nurse that works in ER. Uh, so, for example, a doctor can enter a prescription, but a nurse can never enter a prescription, or uh, unless they're a nurse practitioner or something like that. But that might be another another role. 
um, but those roles can permeate through those groups. So we don't really need to worry too much about groups. What we're mostly concerned about is roles and what somebody in that role has the rights and privileges to do. So very basic uh, uh, command, the create a role, you just do create role, and then you give it a name, and it has to be a unique name. Once you have a role, so for example, I can create a role called attack planner. And once I have that role created, I can grant that person, or that role, uh, select, insert, and update on, in this case, the drone strikes um, table. And then the two, in this case, instead of being a user, it's going to be the role name, which in this case is attack planner. So, again, you get, um, you get that ability to do uh, permissions or granting permissions, but rather than doing this at the user level, we can apply this to an entire role. Uh, and then to put somebody into that role, uh, we use grant and then the role name. So whenever you use the grant uh, keyword with, a, with an actual role name, that two in this case would be which users am I going to put into that role? Am I going to apply to that role? And likewise, you could do revoke. You can remove a user by using the revoke keyword. We're going to learn more about the revoke keyword in just a moment. But, um, but grant. Uh, so we see two examples here. We have granting permissions on an object to a role, and then granting users access to a role or as members of a role. Uh, or it's explicitly saying, in this case, Barney and Miss Beasley are both part of the attack planner role. So Oracle also has a couple predefined roles. Um, the three described in the textbook are Connect, Resource, and DBA. Uh, for this class, you know, I always tell students, if you're going to create a user account, just to make things easy, to grant them DBA uh, roles. So grant um, DBA to and then what you, whatever user account you're using. That way you've got permission to do everything. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, uh, you know, whether you can create a table, alter a table, you don't get error messages telling you that you don't have permission to do something. Uh, so DBA is basically everything. And then uh, uh, there's Connect and Resource. Connect is, is a good role to have, it is a good role in that anybody who's a member of Connect has permission to create a session, which is pretty basic. Everybody has to be able to do that to use the system. So, um, so the Connect role is just a predefined role that, that says everybody can connect um, that's in that role. So, so far we talked about all this stuff to create users and then to grant them access to everything, but sometimes you need to take away that access. So after you give access um, to something for someone, and by the way, in Oracle is implicit deny, which means if you haven't, um, if you haven't explicitly given access to somebody, to something, they won't be able to access it. So as far as revoking goes, the only time you would revoke something is if you've already given access to that. There's really no need to revoke permission to do something if you've never given permission to, to do that. Uh, so, it's, so it's important to understand that, that, that it is, that Oracle is an implicit deny system. If it doesn't see that you're allowed to do something, it will not let you do it. It doesn't assume that you can access everything unless otherwise, you know, unless otherwise listed. So assuming somebody has a system privilege to revoke system privileges, you just, you know, use the keyword revoke. Um, you list the system privileges. You can comma delineate them so you can have multiple ones. Uh, and then you list the username or role name. And again, that can also be comma delineated. Um, and then for the object privilege, the syntax is exactly the same, only we also have to add that on keyword to tell it exactly which object. And we have to give the name of that object a specific table or a specific uh, you know, column or something like that. So here is an example. If I revoke create session from the user Ronald Reagan, you know, maybe this user no longer works for the organization, so we could revoke them from, you know, we could revoke create session from that user, and now they won't be able to create a session, so they would not be able to log in. Uh, and as an added uh, protection against that user logging in, I might also change their password. So by, if I change their password and revoke create session, uh, it's pretty likely that that user will not be able to access the system. Um, and sometimes you do want to create, uh, you know, keep users in the system that have left for, for some reason. Uh, you know, maybe they're referenced somewhere, but uh, but occasionally, you know, you might not want to completely remove the user account. 
And here's another example of, uh, in this case, I'm revoking, you know, maybe this, uh, this user has um, overstepped their authority, and we want to revoke uh, the update privileges on that drone targets uh, table, and, and we're going to do that from a specific user. So this is an example of how to revoke uh, object level permission from a specific user. So I also want to talk about the real world a little bit. Our textbook doesn't really talk about any of this stuff, but I think it's important to cover it a little bit um, because I think when you when you go out in industry, and certainly some of you guys I think already, you know, most of or many of you probably have already had some uh, interaction in, in industry with databases, and um, things don't always work the way they describe it in the textbook. Um, so I like to talk a little bit, sometimes a little bit about how things work in the real world. So uh, let's say we have our database. Um, and so far, we've been talking about these users that are accessing the database sitting at their workstation. And we've been sort of making the assumption that this user is, um, in many cases, interacting with the database with something like SQL Plus or uh, Oracle's GUI. Um, or in some cases, you can write applications that are native Oracle applications. but. Um, but that's assuming the user is interacting directly with the database. Um, here's the thing, though. Um, in many cases, the uh, the user is not interacting with the database. It's usually the DBAs uh, and the IT people. You know, people people like us that uh, administer these systems are the ones that interact directly with the database with things like SQL Plus. Usually, a user is not sitting down at a command prompt. I mean, can you imagine, uh, you know, a data entry clerk? you know, training them on how to write insert statements. I mean, that would be ridiculous. But, you know, maybe you would write a native application in Oracle to do that. But in my experience, that's pretty rare that people that people do that. The reality is we usually have applications that are interfacing with Oracle. And, you know, those applications are programs that are, that are written by, you know, some commercial entity. Um, so they write software that provides a user interface, you know, a friendly user interface. And the users are interacting with that interface. They're not interacting directly with the database. So when they log in to their computer, there's really two ways that, that we'll usually see that happen. Either A, uh, you know, and I think it's probably about 50-50 how you'll see this, but uh, option A is the user opens up whatever the program is that was written to interact with Oracle, and that program is simply passing through the user permissions to Oracle. So the DBA does maintain permissions for everyone that's going to access the database, uh, regardless of how they access, whether it's through this application, this, this commercial application, or, um, or if it's directly into the database. Um, option B, which, which I see a lot of, is where this application that was written um, doesn't use the database for authentication. So, so the application itself authenticates with the database, but then in the database, it creates its own table with usernames and passwords, and then it manages its own access to the database through, through the application. So when the user sits down in front of their computer, they open up this application. When they get their little login to start using the application, they're not actually logging into Oracle at all. Uh, they're connecting directly to this application, which on their behalf logs into Oracle, but it figures out what permissions you have by, uh, by, by maintaining its own access list and its own tables that it that typically would be in the database, although they can be in other places as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, the important thing here is that in that case, the DBA really doesn't have direct control over user privileges and access to information in the database. You're relying on that application layer that's sitting in front of the database to handle that, to handle that stuff. Um, you know, and is one better or one worse? I mean, it, it really depends. Um, you know, I think most of the time we don't have a choice. If the vendor that we're using uh, chooses to do authentication within their own application, we're pretty much stuck with that model, and we rely on them to do it. But, um, but you know, if the vendor relies on Oracle to do those, um, to main, you know, to, to worry about user accounts, then the DBA is responsible for that in the database. So, so really kind of two ways to, to look at this. Uh, but the, the other important thing here that I want you to realize, too, is that in many cases, users are not connecting directly to the database uh, through SQL Plus or, or through the, the SQL um, 
management interface. This is usually happening through some application or through a native Oracle application. There's also the case of, um, of third-party authentication. So LDAP uh, also, it, it, Microsoft Active Directory is an LDAP um, service, but so some of you may be familiar with Active Directory, but LDAP is a um, is a uh, is a network protocol for doing authentication on the network. So basically, an LDAP server is responsible for doing all of your authentication. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, with LDAP, you create your user account one time in LDAP, and LDAP is responsible for uh, authentication for all users on the network. And users can include um, programs. Uh, actual people using the network as well as things like databases like Oracle. And Oracle does support um, LDAP integration. So in that scenario when you have LDAP, rather than having all of your user accounts in the database, uh, you can, uh, or rather than the database authenticating all your users, I should say, uh, they still have to be in there, but the authentication would happen through LDAP. So that means your users, when they log in, whether they're using the application or if they're using uh, the, the, the database directly, it doesn't matter. So everyone logs in on the network through LDAP or through Active Directory or Linux has some, you know, some LDAP libraries too or LDAP programs you can use. Either way, you've got this LDAP server somewhere. It's handling all your authentication and it's figuring out who everyone is on the network. Then when, you use, when your user account uh, goes to access that application to do something in the database, they're not really authenticating through that application or the database. They're already authenticated through LDAP. Um, so LDAP sort of keeps track of, of who everyone is, and then you can, you can put information in the database or in your application level to manage that authorization level. Um, so again, that's LDAP authentication. And you might hear the term single sign-on. So single sign-on or SSO is is all the rage now and the concept is that when a user sits down in front of a computer in an organization they have one username and one password and that logs them into all of the resources on the network and that would include the database and any applications that use the database so it's important to to understand that concept and that it can be done but integrating to LDAP is sort of outside the scope of this course um, but it's certainly something I would encourage you to look into and that's it. That's uh, everything we need to know about user authentication and, and user management, managing access to these objects.